Good evening and welcome. Thank you all for joining us for Gratz College's Schusterman Distinguished Lecture, America's Jewish Women, a History from Colonial Times to Today, featuring Dr. Pamela Nadell. There will be an opportunity tonight to post questions to Pam later in the program. So if you have any questions for her, please enter them using the Q&A tool on your Zoom toolbar. You can also use this tool if you have, if you have a question for, for, our, for our IT support team. Only the host and presenters tonight will see your questions. Uh, this event tonight will be recorded and posted uh, shortly after the, uh, this evening's event when we have a chance to prepare it. And we will share that with everybody who's registered tonight. So now let's get started. Please join me in welcoming the president of Gratz College, Dr. Paul Finkelman. Thank you very much, Naomi, and good evening and welcome to Gratz College uh, online. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening uh, for the Schusterman Lecture. The Schusterman Lecture was created by a very good friend of Gratz College, a former board member of Gratz College, uh, Murray Schusterman of Blessed Memory. Uh, with his support, the Schusterman Lecture has brought many distinguished scholars and others to Gratz College to speak. And tonight, we continue in that history by bringing someone who is, without question, the foremost authority on the history of Jewish women in the United States. Uh, Pamela Nadell is a great scholar, a great teacher, and the author of a wonderful book, which I urge all of you to read. Uh, this lecture is part of the Schusterman series, and Murray's son, Bob Schusterman, has been, like his father, a very good friend of Gratz. Uh, normally, I would have Murray stand up and introduce him to the audience, but of course, I cannot do it today. The other thing that Bob told me about his father is that his father loved to have cookies with events. And again, if we were in Gratz College today, we would be having cookies when this is over. We only look forward to a time, hopefully next spring, when we can once again have a Schusterman lecture in the building and therefore partake of good cookies after a great lecture. I also want to thank the members of the Hyman Gratz Society. The Hyman Gratz Society are those friends of Gratz who contribute at least $1,000 a year to the college. Uh, we normally have a Hyman Gratz dinner on the Schusterman lecture, but again, we can't do that tonight. Um, I urge all of you to consider joining the Hyman Gratz Society. It is one of the mainstays of Gratz College. And as you know, a college of this size survives on the kindness and support of its friends and alums. We are right now celebrating our 125th anniversary. It is worth noting that over the years, there were many small Jewish colleges in many cities across the United States. Gratz remains the only one still functioning as a college, still giving college degrees, still not affiliated with any movement in the Jewish world, but simply a Jewish college supporting Jewish education, supporting Hebrew education, and supporting programs like the Schusterman Lecture and the lecture that we will have tonight. If you would like to learn more about supporting grads, please contact Naomi Hausman, uh, who you can reach on our website and you just heard her speak and she will be back with you later today. Now on to the program. More than 500 people have registered tonight. This is an enormous number of people and it is, I suppose, the silver lining of the current world we're in that people who would not normally be able to come to a grads lecture, people in California, people in Canada, people overseas are watching us tonight. I welcome all of you because um, we have a great speaker. Pamela Nadell uh, won the 2019 National Jewish Book Award for her book, America's Jewish Women, A History from Colonial Times to Today. Um, and one of the people who she writes about in this book is, as we would expect, Rebecca Gratz. Rebecca Gratz was the sister of the person who endowed Gratz College, Hyman Gratz. 
And so it is especially meaningful for us in this 125th anniversary year to have somebody who can talk a bit about the person who is essentially not our founding mother, mother but really the founding spirit behind Gratz, uh, Rebecca Gratz, just as her brother was the person who made Gratz College happen. Uh, and just for a moment, let's hear a voice from the past. Well, you know what they say. Behind every great college is a great woman. <laughs> well, that's me, I suppose. I'm Rebecca Gratz, and my little brother Hyman is the one that founded this school, no doubt inspired by me. <laughs> when I was only 20, I founded my first nonprofit. And by the time I was 57, I founded the first Hebrew Sunday school in America. And like my Sunday school, Gratz College was open to men and women from the moment it was founded leading right all the way up to, well, whatever century this is, <laughs> I hope you'll consider supporting Gratz College with me to help educate the Jewish leaders of tomorrow together. And I hope to see you at the Gratz Gala in December. I'll be wearing a new dress. And how fun was that? Uh, yes, the Gratz Gala will be in December and it will be online and Rebecca will be back, along with other people from Gratz College's past. Um, I'm sure Rebecca Gratz and Hyman Gratz would both be enormously proud of Gratz College and surprised at where we have come to, that we are an online college that when COVID hit, Gratz classes ran as they had before COVID hit, because we had already moved to almost an entirely online platform. And now we've taken our online education courses and moved them to the community with lectures like this. At our 125th anniversary gala in December, we will be honoring Jake Tapper of CNN, a Philadelphia kid with an honorary degree from Gratz College. And at this point, I would like to turn the microphone over to my board chair, Rabbi Dr. Lance Sussman. Uh, as many of you know, Lance is the senior rabbi at Knesset Israel in Elkins Park. He is also a PhD historian. I have worked with Lance. We have co-authored pieces together. Uh, he has been my editor in a book that he and Pamela Nadell published on new essays on American Jewish history. And Lance is a strong, important scholar in his own right. And so we are honored to have him as not only a friend of Gratz, but currently the chair of the board of Gratz. So I turn this now over to Lance, who will introduce our featured speaker, as well as Liz um, Spickle. Spickle of the Jewish Exponent, who will be moderating tonight's event. Lance? Thank you very much, Paul. It's an honor to be here. And welcome to our over 500 viewers from all over the United States. I want to thank you personally for taking time this evening to listen in and participate in this very important program. Uh, as uh, Paul said, uh, I'm Lance Sussman. I'm chair of the Board of Governors of Gratz College. I'm senior rabbi of Reform Congregation Knesset Israel just up the street. And I especially want to extend a warm hello to the members of my rabbi talk group. Uh, they gave up their own program tonight and we're part of the, part of the crowd here tonight at uh, Grat Grads College. We have a very distinguished speaker for our Schusterman series uh, this evening, a person with whom uh, I've had a friendship now for many years, I dare say um, decades, and I'm totally delighted and honored to introduce to you Professor uh, Pamela S. Nadell. Nadell uh, she likes to go by Pam. Um, Pam holds the Patrick Clendon Chair in Women's and Gender History at American University in Washington, D.C. She, hold, she holds the highest honor from that school, Scholar Teacher of the Year. Uh, her books uh, include Women Who Would Be Rabbis, A History of Women's Ordination. She's a past president of the Association for 
Jewish Studies and a recipient of the American Jewish Historical Society's Lee Max Friedman Award for Distinguished Service. Uh, her consulting work for museums includes the National Museum of American Jewish History here in Philadelphia and the Library of Congress in our nation's capital. Uh, tonight, we're going to learn uh, from Pam about uh, her journey into uh, researching and writing about America's Jewish women, a history from colonial times to today, winner of the 2019 Everett Family Foundation's Book of the Year Award, that is the National Jewish Book Award. Uh, and this is uh, just one of many uh, very important publications uh, that Pam has uh, authored over uh, over the years. Uh, helping us uh, and leading us into that conversation tonight, uh, we're delighted to welcome uh, to Gratz College, uh, albeit virtually, we have had personal discussions, Liz Spickle, who was the editor-in-chief of the Philadelphia Jewish Exponent, our weekly Jewish paper here in Philadelphia, as well as the editorial director of the Pittsburgh Jewish Chronicle, and the Phoenix, Arizona Jewish Times. Liz has worked for a variety of new news outlets in her 20 plus years in journalism, from digital startups to legacy print publications, and has taught both journalism and Spanish, not at the same time, at Drexel University, the College of New Jersey, and the University of Texas at Austin. In that spirit, gracias por ayudar. Toda Aha Ezra, thank you for helping. Let's begin our conversation on America's Jewish women. Thank you so much, Lance. I'm so happy to be here with Pam Nadell um, to talk about this wonderful book, which I have here, so that our participants can see this book. Let me get it in the, the right. Um, America's Jewish Women, A History from Colonial Times to Today. So welcome, Pam. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Um, let's just jump right in. You talk in the introduction to the book about your dinner party acquaintances <laughs> who were skeptical that you could take on such a vast project and who would point to themselves and the people around the table and say, look at how different we all are, all of us Jewish women, sort of like as though they had proved their point, you can't write this book, it's too massive. So what made you think that they were wrong and that you could write the book? Um, so for, first of all, let me say thank you so much for joining me. It's um, uh, a little bit audacious to ask a very, very busy newspaper editor who's editing newspapers with, the, with three Ps in the title and, and to ask her to spend so much time reading a book and thinking deeply about it. And I also want to thank Lance Sussman um, and Paul Finkelman for their really kind words. I, so in, in the beginning of the book, I, I tell this story that and it's true i i would periodically i would tell my friends you know usually they were like the mothers of of ki my kids you know friends that kind of thing not historians and i would say you know i'm working on this big book on american jewish women i worked on this book for a very very long time and they would say oh it's impossible you just you know we're all different that you just can't possibly do it so um some of it was that i hit a point where i I had enough scholarship under my belt to begin to write the book. Um, the, the women's history as a field actually doesn't emerge um, in a significant way until the 1970s. And Jewish women's history, especially the writing of American Jewish women, it, it, there, there are some glimmers in the 70s and the 80s, but it really doesn't take off until the 90s. And so, I needed the grounding of all of these wonderful colleagues that I have around the country who wrote these fabulous books and articles, both in terms of Jewish women's history in America and around the world, but also very much in terms of American women's history. I needed to know a lot about the history of American women to see how America's Jewish women were both a part of America's women and stood apart from them. And so once I had that scholarship there, um, I got a little bit more confident that I could actually write this book. And how long did it take? 
So the day I sent off the manuscript, in, uh, May 7th, 2018, not that I remember the date, right? right. Um, my, my daughter, who at that time was 26 and already in medical school, posted a photo of the two of us um, on Facebook. She was four years old and she said, my mom finally finished the book. So I thought about, I thought about writing this for, I'm not joking, I think really for more than 20 years. Um, and I think it, it took, and I wrote a lot of other books along the way. So it, I, I did, Lance and I did a book together and, um, and I wrote Women Who Would Be Rabbis, but I needed really this long period of gestation to think about it. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so the book, I think, well, it was worth it, the, the time that you put right. in, because it really is such an engaging book, as I told you before. Um, I, you know, don't read a ton of history, but found myself really excited about this whole new genre that you opened up to me uh, because of how engaging it is and how you thread so many different narratives through both the particular and the general. And um, it's just a, a, a wonderful scope. And you do, you do see that in some sense, those dinner party acquaintances were correct in that Jewish women are incredibly multifaceted and very different. But I wonder if, you know, now that you've had some time um, away from the subject, um, if you had to pick, let's say, three adjectives that you think you could apply to all of the generations of American Jewish women that you wrote about, could, is there, are there three adjectives that would apply to all of them? That's such a great question. I love it. Um, first of all, I would say activist because these Jewish women were activists going all the way back to the colonial period and all the way up to the contemporary moment. I would say they were change makers um, so that there, there are Jewish women in almost every single period who were changing something in the world around them, whether it was in their households, in their synagogues, or in their wide, wider community. And then for the last one, I probably would say homemakers because they made homes. Um, whether like, so we just heard about Rebecca Gratz, we all know never married, but Rebecca Gratz raised um, the nieces of her, uh, of her sister. Her sister had died in childbirth and she raised her children in her home. So even though she never married, she made a home. And I would say that, that Jewish women have been homemakers, not necessarily in the kind of conventional way that we think of, you know, father and mother and 2.5 kids, but that they have been homemakers across the American Jewish experience. That's so interesting. So I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have picked homemakers, I think, if I, when I was thinking about it. But now that you say it, that really makes sense. What did you um, pick? So, well, I wanted to ask you, I did think about, I think, yeah, activists, change makers, that was something that really struck me. Um, and of course, so being from Philadelphia, um, where bad things happen apparently, um, but you know, I was interested in how much of the early history, you know, there was a lot of, of course, we're all interested in our own stories, right? So I was interested in the Philadelphia stuff. And I was like, especially I loved there was, you know, these, these, these tough Philly gals in the 18th century who resisted these, they flouted the rules, they ignored their husbands, as you wrote, um, and flouted these rules relating to the mikvah. I mean, and, and, but throughout every single generation, there were women who bucked convention. And I wondered, it made me think, as so much of the book did, about my own position as an American Jewish woman, how frightened I often am to butt convention. And I wonder what makes the difference. And if you, if you sort of were able to see over the generations of women making change, what makes the difference between a Rosa Schonenstein, say, um, and, a, and, and a woman who maybe has a seemingly less dramatic more vernacular life. What, what is it that, is, is there some kind of magic? Is it the personality or is it the moment, do you think? I think it has to be a combination. So when, when we talk about um, Rosa Sonnenshine and we talk about, uh, she was the, the editor of a, of, of a weekly, uh, uh, not weekly, but a monthly, she founds a Jewish women's magazine, but she's, but she's a maverick, she's a maverick. She's been a maverick her whole life. I mean, one of the ways she's a maverick is she creates the, the first, what we think is the first Jewish women's book club in America in 1879, and it's still meeting today. 
So you never really kind of know the consequences of some of your actions. Um, but then she's also a maverick because she really can't stand her husband and she walks out on him. I mean, she abandons him in, a, in an era when um, you needed grounds to get divorced. So she couldn't collect any alimony. So she's got to figure out how she's going to earn, earn, some, earn a living. So, um, I, so I think that's a combination of the moment and opportunity and personality. Um, and I do think, I mean, I, I made a very conscious decision to focus on the activists when I, when I wrote the book. There are so many names of Jewish women who left their mark, whether in, the, in our nation's history, in our Jewish history, or in the history of their families. And, um, and I had to choose, was hard, to, you know, what stories was I going to tell? And I, that was something that I really deliberately tried. I, I actually, I, ca I kind of call some of the women characters. They're not characters like in fiction, but they are sort of my hooks into, into certain chapters. And, um, and, so, and they, some of them lived extraordinary lives that we only know about because of the, the tools that we have in terms of the latter part of the latter part of the century. So I think of, I think of one woman um, uh, who lived in, who lived in Philadelphia, uh, who lived in Baltimore, not in Philadelphia. And she, she wanted to be an accountant, but she was observant. And she goes to, she, she goes to college. She goes to get like night school for an accounting degree. And then she's out looking for a job. And the, every, every job that she goes to, they say, you have to work on Saturday mornings because those were the years when it was a five and a half day work week. And she said, I can't do that. I'll work one hour extra every night, which would have given, which would have um, given the, uh, the supervisor or the manager actually some extra time than she would have had, would have gotten, you know, for working just on Saturday morning. And when, when he says no, when he pushes back against it, she, it's the moment she says, I can't do this. I'm not going to be an accountant. So she changes direction and becomes a teacher. So it's the moment and it's the personality and standing up for what she believed in. Yeah, I found myself staring at some of the pictures in the book. I did stare at Rosa's picture and I looked into her face because she was such a maverick. And I thought, you know, how did how at every moment, at every turn, she did something that wasn't the thing that was expected of her. And she managed to find that courage. And of course, I mean, here we're having this conversation um, just as the mourning period that Shiva ends for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who you also write about, um, another maverick, another incredibly strong woman, you know. Um, and I liked how you, you know, you mentioned that the, the quote that, that the question that she asked, what makes a difference between, um, I'm, I'm not saying this perfectly, but a, a bookkeeper in the garment district mm -hmm. and a Supreme Court justice, and then she answers one generation. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how Justice Ginsburg sort of represents America's Jewish women. She represented America's Jewish women in so many ways. And be because you have to remember when she gets out of law school and she can't find a job as a lawyer. She said that, that, that she had three strikes against her. She was a Jew, she was a woman, and she was a mother. And in that sense, she encapsulated so much of what was the experience of American, America's Jews and of course of America's Jewish women in the middle of the 20th century when Jews in the United States still face job discrimination, they face discrimination in housing, they face quotas and discrimination in educational opportunities. And, but she also represented what women faced in American life at that moment in time before the changes that she helped bring about in our legal system, but the changes that came about as a result of the feminist movement, which opened up avenues for women's participation in American life that were utterly revolutionary. I mean, let's be honest. I, I, I wrote my, the coattails of a revolution I didn't make, but I know that when I was interviewed for my job at American University, that they were counting how many women and how many men they were interviewing because of affirmative action. So if that hadn't happened, 
um, I'm not sure that I ever would have had the career that I had if those changes hadn't come into play. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's um, I mean, I guess, and she, she also sort of represents the immigrant experience, which you write a lot about as well. Yeah. So much of that, so much of what you wrote about immigrant Jewish women and sort of struggling to get a foothold and their, their role constantly evolving whether in industry, in, in feminism, their, their, the way they negotiated their marriages, their relationships, their relationship to childbearing. I mean, all of this is like, it's in some ways, it's an archetypal immigrant story. The way that they negotiate their assimilation and their language acquisition and their Americanization and all of that. Um, and yet it is particularly Jewish as well. And I, and I know th there were some tensions that sort of crop up in the book again and again, but one that I noticed in particular was this tension between um, sort of cultural observance and religious observance. Um, and I wanted to um, point especially to a particular passage that you wrote that I felt really sort of put this into focus when you're writing about the late 1930s, the early 40s, I believe, when you wrote that, um, most Jewish women of this era fell somewhere between the poles of devotional observance and ignorant or defiant repudiation. Being Jewish was less about God or synagogue than about a way of living. For this generation, being Jewish meant chicken soup cooking on the stovetop in a Jewish neighborhood with grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins living nearby. It meant buying butter cookies at a bakery often run by a Jewish neighbor and his wife, even if the owners didn't bother with rabbinical supervision. It meant shopping with sisters and sisters-in-law in a department store whose Jewish name blazed boldly above its entrance for a dress to wear to the Hadassah luncheon. Defining being Jewish for this generation was imprecise, perhaps because it rarely needed to be articulated. Jews knew who they were. So did those who turned them away from hotels and refused to rent them apartments. And I know that's a long, a long quote that I just read to you of your own book, but I wanted people to hear the language. It's such beautiful writing, but also it really encapsulates, we still have this, this struggle, right? I mean, we have the so-called um, cultural Jews, the, the bagel and lox Jews, the people who define themselves according to the chicken soup on the stove with matzo ball soup, whatever it might be. And we have the people who define themselves primarily according to their ritual practice. And I just wonder um, how you've seen that kind of tension evolve and, and how, it, how it changed through the generations and as you were you know, writing about it in the book. What's so astonishing is that that is the story of the American Jewish experience going all the way back to colonial days and all the way up to our own moment in time. And it's why, it's why my friends would say, well, you can't possibly write this book because you, how do you how do you include all of them and I was I, I really tried and I and thanks for reading that passage um, I really tried to pay attention to these different varieties of America's Jewish women and e even in, in in the preface to the book I open with um, uh, Grace uh, Mendesicious Nathan who was observant. I mean, she, she was an observant woman, and her, bro her brother was actually the Chazam, the leader of, um, of New York's um, Sharif Israel congregation. And I open with, with talking about her and about her traditional life. And then also, she's a maverick in her own way, because she makes a change in, in Jewish tradition um, at, uh, at, uh, in her ethical will when she tells her, her son um, that at her death, he should only keep his beard for seven days, because she, she, wants, she doesn't want him not to shave for the 30 days that Jewish tradition says a man doesn't shave after the death of a parent. And sometimes some Jewish traditions, um, it's a full year. Um, but her great granddaughter was a woman who was much more culturally Jewish and was, didn't have you know, strong traditional observance. Her great granddaughter happened to be Emma Lazarus, who left us an extraordinary legacy of the poem, The New Colossus, in the base of the Statue of Liberty, and who defended 
the Jewish people and who wrote a powerful essay as early as 1882 saying the Jews need their own state because of anti-Semitism. They need their own, they must establish a nationality. So she's, she's a proto-Zionist. So she's, she's a different kind of Jewish woman and expresses her Jewishness very differently. And that's what I was trying to get at from those who were the bagels and lox or the matzo ball soup on the stove um, to those who were religiously observant and, and also even to those who repudiated Judaism entirely, tried to run away from their Jewish identities or maybe that's not the right term, ignore them, not important, but then every once in a while somebody would remind them that it was very important that they were Jewish. Right, or they were, or they were reminded because of the way other people perceived them and, and you do, you do write about, about that too, about anti-Semitism that the women confronted in addition to all of the other challenges that they were confronting. Um, but I like that that wasn't, it wasn't the overwhelming um, definition of their experience. It was sort of folded in to, um, to the larger experience. Um, you know, talking about Emma Lazarus, she's one of the women in, like you were saying that you created characters and that was something that I felt really worked for. I mean, I read a lot of fiction. Um, every, we all like a good story. And these women who were characters um, were, sort of pulled us through. And I liked the way that you were able to say things like, we, at, you know, this woman who we met before, we, we met her on her wedding day, and then we would see her, you know, years later. I wonder, though, from a just practical perspective, how did you decide, I mean, from all of these Jewish women across the generations, did, were you sort of, um, was it determined largely by who left written records, who became more prominent um, in terms of just access to their stories? De I mean, obviously you need records if you're going to write, you know, I, 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 until you get to the modern period, I can't do interviews. I couldn't do, you know, journalist style interviews. So um, it was really important that they, that they left some kind of written record, um, but there, the, the plethora of written records is overwhelming. So I should say that the original manuscript was twice as long. And then I got a lot of very good advice and I was told that if anybody, if I wanted anybody other than my academic colleagues to read the book that I needed to cut it. And I did to about 260 pages of text. And um, so a lot of really interesting women ended up on the cutting room floor. But I was trying to follow certain threads. So one, of, and, and, and I was lucky that I could see these connections. So for example, you, you can't write a book like this and not mention the Holocaust survivors who come to the United States. And I, the, an, I have an entire four or five shelves downstairs in my library of memoirs by women who were Holocaust survivors who came to the United States. But I have to choose one. And I wanted, and I ended up choosing a woman who was the niece of a woman I talked about earlier in the book. So, and also it happened, her, um, it, her, her name was Luba Bott. Her, um, she was the niece of um, a woman named Bessie Abramowitz Hillman, who was a very important labor leader. And I was lucky, I found Luba Bott's unpublished memoirs of her experience. And so they're in the Yad Vashem archives and I was able to get a copy of that. So I could also, also wanted to tell stories that hadn't been told before. And so that was one way of doing that. And I noticed that there were women, sometimes there were women who would get, you know, I think there was a woman named, was it Minnie Seltzer, Mamie Seltzer, you know, women who might get just a few sentences, but having the name and maybe just a few evocative sentences, it made you feel um, a little bit more like this is a book that's full of people. It's not just um, facts, you know, so I feel like that was helpful. Well, I'm of the hist history school that believes that people make history. So it's, for me, it's, I mean, I, I don't write institutional history, um, but even in institutions, people make history. So it would be impossible to write about America's Jewish women and not talk about the individual women. And you, you mentioned um, Bessie Hillman. Mm -hmm. um, that is so interesting to me because I grew up going to, I had a, a babysitter named Aunt Rose, um, who I loved going to her apartment in the Sydney Hillman building. 
And as a, as a kid, and she, she did try and feed me liver one time, and that didn't work out so well. <laughs> but um, other than that, I loved going there and watching Lawrence Welk and eating dinner with her. And I, I ha so in my mind as a child, the name Sidney Hillman was filled with this sort of magic. Um, and I did learn later about who Sidney Hillman was, but I didn't know much. I didn't really know anything until I read this book about Bessie Hillman. So, you know. And, and she was she was such an extraordinary labor leader. And of course, her, her one of her, I mean, she had many famous quotes, but one of them is that she said, you know, I, I was Bessie Abramowitz before he was Sidney Hillman. <laughs> and, um, because she was actually a well-known labor leader in Chicago. Um, and, then, and then they met and they fell in love and she helps him um, found the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America, which she becomes the president of and they end up moving to New York. And then here's this kind of classic story when I talk about being a homemaker. So, so they move to New York, that she has two kids, but when they move to New York, they decide that only one of them should get a salary from the union. So guess who gets the salary from the union? But meanwhile, she works for the union. She, she um, has a long-term babysitter and leaves the kids with the babysitter and works for the union, goes into the city, they're living somewhere out in the suburbs. And, um, and, and works without pay for the union until he died. And then she draws a salary from the union. Remarkable. There were so many stories like that of women who I really hadn't heard a lot about. And when I heard about what they had accomplished, I thought, how is it possible that I didn't know these names already? And I guess that kind of points to, I mean, do you, do you feel as a historian a sort of responsibility to elevate these, um, women's stories that haven't been told? As a historian, I feel the responsibility to elevate all stories. All stories. Um, I, 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 as for me, you know, history for me is a passion. Um, my kids have no interest in history, but the history for me is, is the, for me, there's nothing more important, I mean, you know, that in terms of my professional life than transmitting history. I think, if we don't know our past, we have no way of moving into the future. And I don't believe the past repeats itself, but we need, we need to be informed by the past. And in terms of women's history, what's really striking, this, this was actually the theme of women who would be rabbis when I wrote that book. Um, the women had argued in the United States about becoming rabbis starting in Philadelphia on the front page of the Philadelphia Jewish Exponent with, uh, with an article that Mary M. Cohn wrote asking, can not our women be ministers? And the year was eight, it was March of 1889. And now I know it was the Purim issue, and, but I don't think she was writing deliberately, you know, in a, a, a facetious way. And American Jews had an argument about women becoming rabbis from 1889 until we get women ordained in the almost the last quarter of the 20th century. But the problem was if you, they didn't know their history. So Mary Cohn would write and then somebody else would write, but she wouldn't have read what the earlier women had, had written. And so each time they had to reinvent the wheel. And they, they did because I could, I could see what they were writing and if they had only known the history before, they wouldn't have had to re rediscover for themselves these arguments. So I think knowing history is absolutely critical. And in this case, because my subject was America's Jewish women, knowing this history is just so powerful. And as you said, you know, it made you think about your babysitter and made you think about, you know, your own stories and it puts them into a broader context. Absolutely. I, I was blown away by, you know, my great grandfather he is the, you know, it's the family lore. He's the bigamist in the family. Um, he and my, so my, my grandmother was born illegitimate and she used to joke about it and, um, and there's all kinds of scandal and everything. But, you know, then reading your book, I read about men who deserted their wives, their first wives, you know, took up with somebody else. I mean, this is exactly what my great grandfather did. And in all of the talk in the family, we've always talked about him. I never thought about the woman that he left behind, despite the fact that two of my aunts were, were her children. Mm -hmm. So 
and I and I knew them my whole life, you know. And I saw so reading your book, I started thinking about finding out about more about her story. Oh, she was deserted. That was the word that you used, and you used it in in, in the subsequent generations too. When you wrote about the Quake High, where my mother went to school in Newark, New Jersey, you know, men who deserted their families, and um, it, it just was so striking how yeah, you can see you know your own life threaded through all of these generations. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, it was, I mean, I loved when we were, when we were preparing for tonight, we were talking about Week Wake High. Um, it, it, uh, high school, it was Phil Ross High School in Newark, New Jersey, but he, he grew, that, that school was 90% Jewish. I mean, it was like a shtetl um, in, in the 1930s and the 1940s. And so that would also enable me then to tease out characters from places like that, um, where I knew the experiences would be representative of a larger group. Right. What, one thing that I think has changed radically in Jewish women's life, so you wrote at one point about how you couldn't sit down next to a woman without her saying, are you a member of Hadassah? And I thought, wow, that's, that's really striking because I have never had that happen to me. No woman has ever said, I mean, that's sort of not, even though I do, I have plenty of interface with institutional Judaism, but I feel like the contemporary American Jewish woman, I mean, how has her relationship to institutions of that kind changed? There, there was a moment when, uh, so when that, when I, I, I wrote that sentence, it was about the immediate post-war period, the 19, after World War II, the 1950s, the very, very early 1960s, when American Jews move uh, in enormous numbers to the suburbs, this happened obviously in Philadelphia, and, there, and women are very much at that point out of the workforce. Um, uh, in the Jewish community, or if they're working, and a lot of them were, but they were they were helping out, right? They were always helping out in the family business. And, you know, my, my grandmother who did the books for my grandfather's shoe store, that kind of thing. And, but in that, in that era when American Jews were building new communities um, in, in the suburbs of, you know, where they had, had um, left the cities, the, the men were out working. They were either running businesses locally or they were going into the cities to work. And the women were making homes and they were making community. And one of the ways that they made community was that they brought the, the, these organizations that had been around for a while, like Hadassah, like the National Council of Jewish Women, and they established new chapters of them. So you met somebody, she's your neighbor, and you turn to her and you say, do you belong to Hadassah? If not, come to my meeting because that was that was their social outlet. That was the center of their life, and that was also a way that they could help the Jewish people. Because you have to remember what the purposes of these organizations were. Right. Right. And now it's just we're more atomized. We're there's so many different avenues for engagement and connection. Right, and that was the result of the feminist movement that propelled. America's Jewish women in huge numbers out into the workforce. First into higher education. Jewish women have for a long time now and continue to remain disproportionately well educated when compared with other white American women. I'm not saying all Jews are white. I'm only saying that's the comparison group and that American Jewish women um, have double the number of advanced degrees of other white American women. And so they, you know, like you, you and I, we ended up in the workforce. Right. Right. Did you have a favorite time period or a favorite group of women or even a favorite individual woman, you know, that you wrote about in the book? It's so hard to choose. There were, there were so, there were so many. I, I did find as I got to the contemporary period, as I got to the post-World War II chapter and, and then moving up into the 21st century, that that was the easiest in some ways to write. Some ways the hardest because there was the, the choices were infinite, but then also in some ways the most exciting and the easiest um, to write. And I really liked writing about the women who were 
feminists, the, number, the extraordinary number of Jewish women who were in the forefront of the feminist movement. Anybody who watched Mrs. America recently um, knows that they pretty much masked a lot of that in, in the TV show. But you know, if you look at all the feminists, most of them were, um, were Jewish women. And what, what I found really exciting about writing about that period was I, I wanted to know why Jewish women were so disproportionately represented in the forefront of feminism, wherever they were making their mark. mark. So Ruth Bader Ginsburg made her mark in the law. Letty Pogrebin made her mark in journalism. Um, and I, and I, I came to the conclusion that there's a, a deep connection between that level of education that Jewish women have and their ability to emerge as leaders in the feminist movement. I'm not saying there were disproportionately represented in the movement overall, but they were certainly disproportionately represented in the leadership. And I like, and because I teach college, I like to think that what the, the skills that they acquired in college really mattered, that they learned how to think, they learned how to write, they learned how to speak. Um, and in a certain era, they also learned how to run a mimeograph machine. And that enabled them to emerge as leaders in those movements. Do you think, um, uh, well, a lot of times when I, when I, when we're trying to decide on a headline for one of the newspapers, I often think about future historians who are going to come back digging through the archives and are going to say, you know, what were, what were Jewish people in Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, you know, talking about in 2020? And I, I feel pressure, you know, like, like um, to make sure that the headlines represent what's happening in the community for the future. Um, do you have a sense as a historian how America's Jewish women in this moment will be um, will be characterized in the future by future historians? Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, first of all, thank you for writing those headlines. Thank you for publishing, <laughs> because I used lots and lots of newspaper. Uh, material. There was actually a point when I was writing one of the chapters of the book, and I was chairman of the history department at my university, and I, 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 I could only snatch little moments in time, and I found that it was very easy to do research in newspapers in between meetings. That I, that was what I could kind of, I could kind of squeeze in. So, what will the paper say? You know, I mean, you have to think of what what are the papers showing us today. Um, that historians will pick up on in the future. And I think if I go back to my, my, the adjectives from the beginning that you asked about, they're activists, they're change makers, but I'm also thinking about, you know, all the writing that I read um, about the challenges, especially in this COVID moment of being homemakers and raising children and taking care of extended family. So that hasn't, that hasn't changed. So I think in that sense, maybe whoever writes the sequel to this will be able to work with those with those same kinds of um, themes. I, I actually, in in March, when before we sort of knew what we were going to be dealing with with COVID, I did go back to some um, accounts from 1918 of the pandemic to get a sense of like what daily life was like for people and how people were living and um, it, I mean, I guess it was, it was somewhat prepared me, but I, you know, the, you know, you say that your children aren't interested in history in the same way that you are or, or, or much at all. I mean, how do we, I, I know exactly what you're talking about when you talk about um, people sort of not knowing history and so then posing the same questions again and again. I get pitches from young journalists about things that I kind of felt like we, we were talking about this 20 years ago, like, are we going to do this again? You know. Um, and they just don't know. And then I tell them this whole history of something and, and, and they're shocked. And it, how do we get people more engaged with history? How do we, how do we get people interested, excited, knowledgeable? The first thing we have to do is we have to tell the stories right. So we need to, I mean, academic historians, and I've written books like this, we write, you know, very heavy books with lots of footnotes that um, are, we write very much for our colleagues. And um, there are only certain books that reach more widely to tell the story more widely. So I think that's, that's the first thing. And then, of course, today we have so many different ways of telling stories. 
So we have film and we have media and social media. We have different ways. So I think um, if, but, but you, want, you want it to be curated because you want it to be accurate. You want it to be, um, uh, to, to present the stories right. Um, and, you know, that was very much what we did when we were creating the National Museum of American Jewish History, you know, right down, not, not too far away from the college. And we were determined to make a, 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 a story that would relate to people of different ages and they would be able to under, understand that. And, um, and it's, not, it's not easy to do, um, especially the, the kind of, the more concise the medium, the harder it can be. So in a book of 250 pages, I've got a lot of space. And, and, and I don't usually write a book of 250 pages about over 350 years. So I, I can really tell the story in great detail. When you get to like a museum or you get to some kind of posting, a blog post, or you get to the newspaper story that's going to have a historical perspective, you've got a lot of constraints. And it's hard, I think it's hard for a lot of people to be concise. Yes, that is definitely true. I can say as an editor, I, I agree. <laughs> Um, well, you did write about anti-Semitism in this book, but I know that you are also working on a new project that tackles anti-Semitism. So I wondered if you could just um, tell us a little bit about that, about what you're working on now. Thank you. So um, I think like so many people, um, since Pittsburgh and Poe, and their names have become metonyms for violence in our society um, against Jews, I, I think all of us are thinking about anti-Semitism in new ways at, at this moment. And as a historian, it's, that's how I, I think. And I'm really interested in understanding this long history of anti-Semitism in American life. And I'm, I'm particularly interested in understanding how Jewish women confronted it and how they re, um, responded to it. And so I've been working, because I finished this book a couple of years ago, I've been working now on thinking about anti-Semitism, which did crop up in the book. I, I, as you said, it's, it's, it, it's kind of striking how it just kind of spiked throughout. Um, but now I'm thinking about it in a much more sustained fashion. And I'm interested in the fact that one of the ways in which I'm an organization, the National Council of Jewish Women responded to anti-Semitism in the early 19 teens, in 19 teens and 1920, um, there editions of Mother Goose used to have this rhyme about Jack being a rogue of a Jew. And um, they were sent into, they, they decided they, they would get all the women around the country who belonged to the organization. They would go into their local bookstores. They would open the editions of Mother Goose, see if that was still in there, and, um, and then protest to the owners of the stores that they should sell editions that didn't have that poem. And so it's a kind of small story but a very powerful story. And eventually that poem disappears from editions of Mother Goose. You didn't grow up with it. I didn't grow up with it. Um, but it, even as late as the 1960s, it was still appearing occasionally in editions of Mother Goose. So I'm interested in what Jewish women did when they saw anti-Semitism and how they confronted it. And, and is that um, how, is that something that you just started working on, or is I I've been think well I I've been really thinking about it seriously for about a year now, and I've been collecting some amazing stories. Um, when I was live in person speaking to people about the book, um, I would ask people, and I will ask the audience now to send me um, stories about your past, because what's where you encountered anti-Semitism. What's so striking is the power of the way the stories I'm collecting, um, the, they come. The, what, people, what people remember 50 years after an event happened, it's like they never forgot it. You, I mean, I don't know if you want to tell everybody, but you told me this amazing story when we were talking the other day. Yeah, I, I mean, I, when I did a semester abroad in Spain in 1989, and um, the dorm that I lived in, the they were just very anti-Semitic, the boys on that, in that dorm. I mean, it wasn't just in that dorm. Um, but they, yeah, they would um, harass me. They would give me a Heil Hitler when they saw me walking down the hall. They grabbed my sleeve, pulled up my sleeve, and said, where are your numbers? 
They just, um, they were obsessed with the fact that I was a Jew. And um, it was, there, there was actually only one Jewish person. He was called El Judio, who lived in the town. So it, they didn't have any exposure. But yeah, as you say, though, I remember those moments with, I mean, sh shattering clarity, you know, um, and it was so long ago. Um, and I'm sure that the people who are watching this now, yes, I'm sure they could send you their stories because it, it, it is interesting how it really sticks in your mind. I mean, there are other moments too of, of being confronted. I think some of it is being confronted with the fact that you're seen as the other mm -hmm. and you don't see yourself as the other in your daily life. And so it's very striking when it happens like, oh, right, right. I'm not. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, because for so much of American Jewish history, America's Jewish women have thought that they were part of America's women. But then anti-Semitism, it's not the only way, but anti-Semitism keeps reminding them, keeps reminding us that we are not fully a part of America's Jewish women, America's women. That, we're, that, we're, that, that distinction continues. And, and that the story that of Edna Ferber being in that, that you write about, where she's with people who admire her and then they find out she's a Jew and she says she sees in their faces this hatred. I mean, what a, what a powerful moment of just realizing, you know, that she's not, she thought she was sort of the belle of them all and then finds out it's different. Right, and she's a Pulitzer Prize winner, and every, everybody knows all of her work. But but she's she she's invited to a soiree where she has to stay overnight. It's in some some industrialist, you know, country home. And and what she when she when they start talking about Jew money grubbing Jews controlling the world, and she stands up and says, "I am a Jew," and then she confronts that hatred. But what she also says is when she went to her room that night. Not only did she lock the door, she put a chair against it because she was so frightened. So the, these confrontations, like the ones that you had with anti-Semitism, they, they somehow they leave such a powerful mark um, that it's really astonishing. Well, why don't we get some questions from our audience members? Um, I think that Naomi is going to facilitate that part of it. Um, so I'm not sure what I am supposed to do right now. Um, there she is. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm back. Hi. Hi. So this is an incredible conversation. Thank you both so much. So we're all going to sort of stay here together and I will share some of the questions that have come through um, in our uh, Q&A. So one is about um, the, if, if Pam, you have found um, significant differences between the Sephardic women and the Ashkenazic women that you write about. Unfortunately, I wrote mostly about Ashkenazic women um, after I get to the 19th century, but I do write about the Sephardic women earlier mm -hmm. and then talk ab about them a little bit. Um, uh, Sephardic women as the ones who come from the Ottoman Empire at the beginning of the 20th century. And I didn't find striking differences um, because I think they're, they're all dealing with this, whether they're Ashkenazic or Sephardic, they're dealing with what Liz was talking about before, the same kind of, of um, acculturation, adaptation, integration into American life. And mm -hmm. so I didn't find huge differences. Okay. Uh, another question was about the, um, a little, uh, if you could talk a little bit about colonial Jewish women. So I, I, can, I can actually talk a lot about colonial Jewish women, but I'll make it brief. Um, there was a, a Jewish woman in colonial days named um, Abigail Levy Franks. And she was, I call her the great letter writer of colonial Jewry because um, her eldest son, Naftali, went to England um, to join the family business and he saved the letters that she sent to him. And they, they were eventually published. In the 1960s, they were published as the letters of the Franks family. In the early 2000s, they were republished as the letters of Abigail Levy Franks because she wrote 38 of the 40 odd letters. Um, and we know so much about her. Here's a woman who's completely integrated into her New York community at a time when there were about 300 Jews living in New York in the um, early 18th century. She was married to a businessman. 
She, um, they were observant. They said their prayers at home. She had her daughters educated in um, Hebrew, mm -hmm. um, which was really tutored in Hebrew. It's really quite unusual. Um, but she was also like feisty, like we were talking about before, feisty and, and different. And she didn't like when one of the, here's a, where you see Sephardic Ashkenazic difference. One of the Sephardic Gomez's came courting one of her daughters. And she mm -hmm. said, and I quote, he was such a stupid wretch that she was sure that um, her daughter would never give him her consent and she wasn't going to give consent either. Mm -hmm. um, but Abigail also had her heart broken because when another of her daughters secretly intermarried with a Protestant, Oliver Delancey, um, her spirit, she wrote, was so crushed that she never wanted to see or speak to anybody again. So we also see with her story, we see this long history of the questions about intermarriage um, in the American Jewish community going all the way back to colonial days. It's not just a late 20th century phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, thank you, Pam. Um, some other questions sort of looking at different um, aspects of Jewish women. Um, this one is about um, the difference between uh, women, Jewish women in the South versus Jewish women in the North, specifically during the time of slavery in the United States. They're, de they're definitely distinctions. And, um, and if we go back to during the time of slavery and during the time of the Civil War, one of the things that we know about American Jews during the Civil War is essentially geography dictated which side they were on. Most Jews were in the North, um, so they were for the Union, um, but there was a significant number of Jews who lived in the South, several thousands, and um, who, who fought, several thousand who fought in the war, and tens of thousands who lived in various places. And we, we have lots of material from Jewish women in the South who had slaves, who um, were very upset when slavery was abolished, um, one woman, Eleanor Cohn, actually wrote that she didn't like having um, Irish women serve her. She missed um, having slavery. And so there are definitely distinctions and differences, but they were the distinctions and differences that reflected what was going on in American life. Right, right. Um, a question about women's role in the suffrage movement came through as well. Uh, can you speak um, a little bit about that? Yeah, well, of course, it's very timely. Um, and America's Jewish women, some of their activism was around suffrage. And I would say that, that far more Jewish women were in favor of suffrage than were opposed to suffrage. But there's a very famous pair of sisters Annie Nathan Mayer and Maud Nathan. Maud Nathan, um, th these are also part of uh, Emma Lazarus's family, part of that same family. Maud Nathan was um, very active in the suffrage movement and her sister Annie Nathan Mayer was, a found was the founder of Barnard College and was opposed to women's suffrage. And they would sort of like write like dueling, dueling pieces in the newspaper. They would write, you know, I'm against suffrage. Women don't need the vote. They're represented by their husbands. And Maude Nathan would write, you know, of course women needed to have suffrage. Um, there, there's great material on women in the suffrage movement. And my colleague, Melissa Clapper, I'm sure many of you know, because um, uh, she lives in Philadelphia, um, has written a fabulous book called Ballots, Babies, and Banners of Peace, all about Jewish women in the suffrage movement. Okay. Uh, this is, a, I think, a very interesting question. Have you written about any famous mother and daughter duos? Oh, that's interesting. Do I write about any famous mother and daughter duos? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I, have to, I have to do some thinking about that one. I haven't, I haven't really thought, thought about that. Um, I don't know. Do you have any ideas? Liz, do you have any <laughs> idea of a famous mother-daughter duo? For the next edition, right? <laughs> yeah, for the next edition. I can't, I just, like, nobody comes, I mean, I certainly didn't write about anyone's, but I can't even think about, you know, anyone in, in particular. I mean, Jenny Grossinger gave, I'm, I'm sure her daughter succeeded her in the hotel business. Um, I wrote about Jenny Grossinger, but I didn't write about her daughter. Okay. Um, there's a question here about um, what percentage of the women you studied have families who remain Jewish? I'm assuming, you know, over time. Yes. Right. So over time. In the, in the colonial period, Abigail Levy Franks, there's the assumption that none of her grandchildren were Jewish, um, that her, her daughter married out, her son married out, 
Um, and uh, even though Naftali, the son that she was writing to in England, um, he married his cousin and they were Jewish, but that eventually they fell away. I don't really have any way of, of judging that. Um, we, we know that there, there are periods where uh, Amer in the United States, American Jews did not necessarily have to convert to Christianity in order to assimilate the way they had to do in Europe. Um, and I did write about Jewish women who converted, um, but I don't really have a sense of how many of the families over the long haul remain mm -hmm. Jewish. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I think it's just sort of a general question about um, uh, stories, very specific stories um, from the women that you described in the book um, and told their stories. Were there, of those stories, were there any that are your favorites? So I have just like so many faces. So many, it's hard to choose, yeah, right? So it's so it, it is. It's 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 hard to choose. Um, I I I mean we well, so we talked about Bessie and we talked about Rosa and I, you know and the, I call them like my characters. So I call them by their by their first names. I'll I'll talk I'll talk about one um, from the feminist movement. Um, there there was a a feminist activist whose name was Sonia Pressman. And she, she was a refugee from um, Nazi Germany, came in the 1930s to the United States, gets an education, becomes a lawyer, and has that classic experience that so many women had at that moment. She cannot get a job. And she ends up eventually working for the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission. And, and her story is, is, you know, again, this, this activist using the moment. And it's the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission was established to enforce Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, and which prohibited discrimination based not only on race, but also on sex. And the, the complaints are coming in, it's the, early, the middle of the 60s, and the complaints are coming in, and most of, of them are, two thirds of them are about race, but one third are, are sex discrimination. But the lawyers in the office are not taking the sex discrimination complaints. They're not interested in it because there are hardly any women lawyers in that office. Mm -hmm. The men are only interested in the racial complaints. And she actually goes to Betty Friedan and says, women need their own civil rights organization. And they cre end up creating the National Organization for Women and 12% of its founding members were Jewish women. So it's part of that women's, Jewish women being in the forefront of the feminist movement. And that mm -hmm. helped to change the world. Wonderful. Um, question, uh, oh, we have a few suggestions that came through about mother-daughter duos. Oh, good. Abigail's I daughter, wanna... Rebecca, attended the Mishkianza. We have here Letty Pogribin and her daughter, I think yeah. that, Abigail, yes, yeah, same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Abby, I know Abby, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, question about, uh, in your research, um, and in the book, did you, um, do you discuss the, the Jap stereotype that has, seems to never go away? <laughs> right. I, I actually, I don't know that I mentioned it at all. I, I made a very conscious decision that I wasn't going to talk about stereotypes and also about Jewish women in culture. It, this, it was impossible to really include the enormous contributions that Jewish women have made to mm. popular culture and high culture. And, um, and I got criticized in the New York Times. Um, this is the only criticism, so it was perfectly fine. When the book was reviewed, um, it said that I only gave a sentence to Barbara Streisand. Mm. So I thought, well, you know, you, Barbara Streisand either gets an entire book or she gets one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've written elsewhere a whole big thing about Yentl because I, I, I have some really, I, I think, some interesting ideas about that movie. Um, but I, I didn't deal with stereotypes um, because it, it, I was focusing on women and the stereotypes are crafted by other people. Right. So focusing on the stories of women. Right. I like that. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting question about uh, the sartorial details that you provide for many of the women you write about. And the question is about, uh, is how much do historians like you rely on fashion to understand culture when you're looking at women's history? I actually opened the book 
by talking about the clothing of the women in my family. So I, I have these family photos and, and uh, it's clothing and, and hair. And it, it, I have a photo of my great grandmother and she's wearing, a sh she's definitely in this photo wearing a shidle. If I showed it, you would see that the hairline. And then I have a photo of her uh, daughter, my grandmother, who was about 14 when it was taken, first decade of the 20th century. And she's dressed in this fabulous lingerie dress, which was, uh, which a former student of mine told me was only in style between 1903 and 1910. So she's very au courant. Mm -hmm. And then I have a photo of my mother and she's, her back is to us and she's, and the photos aren't in the book, but, um, but she's wearing a, a, a white blouse and a black pencil skirt. And she's in a park on a warm spring day in the 1950s. And there's a baby's bonnet peeking over her shoulder and that's me. <laughs> and then I don't, I don't talk about me, but I'm always wearing a black jacket. Even if I'm on Zoom, I put on a black jacket. <laughs> and then I have a photo of my daughter who, right, black jacket, right? And I have a photo of my daughter who was at that point a college student and she's wearing um, a short skirt and tall boots. And I used the images to ask the question, just as their clothing had changed, how had their lives changed? And so I do pay attention to what the women are wearing. I pay attention to what Grace Neatham wears, and that photo is in the book. Pay attention to what Emma Lazarus is wearing. I pay, Liz, you said you love that photo of Rosa Sonnenshine. I pay, I, I had three photos I could have chosen um, of her that have last, but I, that have survived, but I talk about, you know, she's wearing the, this frock bought in Europe. Her waist is cinched into a bustle and, Clothing changed and their lives changed. And historians, that's what we write about. We write about change over time. Mm -hmm. Here's the, um, the picture yeah. of Rosa. <laughs> oh, you yeah, found it, it right away. Such an, impressive, um, such an impressive dress. <laughs> it really, really is. Uh, another interesting question came through about um, whether or not you write uh, about the relationship between women and organized crime. Was there one? Is, did it come? Were there any stories that you can tell about that? Um, I didn't write about organized crime. I wrote about prostitution. Mm. So there's a moment in the American Jewish experience when the, in the East European immigrant experience, when we ha when Jewish women, one of the ways in which they earned a living was as prostitutes. And, um, and there's also the organizations are combating what they called white slavery at that moment in time. And then they're very proud that it seems to be that the number of Jewish women who are uh, prostitutes seems to go down in the 1920s and they take credit for that. I write about a Jewish woman named Polly Adler who was a famous madam, spent quite a bit of time in jail. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't only gonna write about you know, the nurses and the teachers and the lawyers. I, right. I want to get at Jewish women in their vast variety of occupations. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, wonderful. Um, Liz, do you have any other questions for, for Pam? Um, let me see here. Um, I think, I guess one of my questions is about process. Like I often, I have this sort of romantic idea of being a historian, um, only because when I've written historical pieces and I've gone to like the library company of Philadelphia or something, and I get to dig through these boxes of musty letters and documents and it's the most exciting thing you know to be touching the handwriting of somebody that i'm now writing about a hundred years later i mean it's just really such a thrill but i wonder about the, the contemporary historian i mean when you're doing a book like this or the project that you're working on now how much of that is digging around in, in old boxes um i mean maybe is that even is that sort of not even necessary anymore because we live in this digital age it remains necessary, but because of the digital age, it's possible to dig in them online. Mm. And, it, and it's extraordinary. So um, one of the, something that I, I wrote um, in, in, the, in the spring, um, I wrote about a woman actually from Philadelphia, Nina Marias. She's, I, I don't even think she's mentioned in the book, but Nina Marias, later Nina Marias Cohen. She was the daughter of Rabbi Sabato Marias um, from Mikvah Israel Congregation. And I found an extraordinary amount of information about her. I, I was writing about her because she was um, an early uh, Jewish woman who was a suffragist. Um, but she was also, she wrote a very important essay about anti-Semitism and she wrote it in uh, mainstream 
magazine in the late 19th century, and I was, I was, it was one of the things on anti-Semitism I was working on. But I wanted to see some archival material. I wanted both to see some material at Penn and some material in Minnesota where she had ended up living, but I couldn't get to them. So I had to write the article without it. So I missed that digging. There is something really wonderful about digging in archival boxes. So one day, again. Well, I will be sure to send you uh, many of the ideas that have come through about uh, mother, uh, father, I'm sorry, uh, mother and daughter duos. Great. That seems to have struck a nerve. So we think <laughs> <laughs> I'll get those to you uh, after the, 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 the lecture tonight. So with that, I think it is time to close. I would like to thank you, Pam, for such a rich and insightful discussion. Uh, I know I've learned a lot and I, I'm sure that um, so many of us have tonight. We've had uh, hundreds and hundreds of people on the call and, uh, on this webinar, um, and I know that the issues that you discuss resonate with us, um, even from many, many hundreds of years ago, uh, so much of the stories uh, that we're learning about tonight um, and that you wrote about in the book are still so relevant and important today. Um, so thank you for that. And Liz, thank you for so beautifully facilitating this discussion um, and really bringing out all of this depth and allowing us to sort of, sort of dive deep into these, into these stories. So thank you both. Thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. And I wish you all a good night and a happy new year.